Dobry wieczór, witam na specjalnej edycji wykładu z cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury, edycji organizowanej w ramach wyjątkowego wydarzenia, jakim jest For Design Days. Być może są tu osoby, które po raz pierwszy uczestniczą w wykładzie z cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury, więc pozwolę sobie w kilku słowach przedstawić, czym jest nasza seria wykładów. Każdego roku cztery razy organizujemy wykłady, gdzie zapraszamy znanych zagranicznych architektów. Seria trwa już od 2004 roku, także w zeszłym roku świętowaliśmy piastnastolecie cyklu. Twórcą cyklu jest Wojciech Małecki, którego serdecznie witamy tutaj wśród uczestników. I od razu chciałbym was zaprosić na antresole Spotka, gdzie znajduje się wystawa z okazji 15-lecia cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury, która podsumowuje em, architektów, którzy w tym czasie przyjeżdżali do Katowic, żeby opowiedzieć o swojej twórczości. Dzisiaj mamy architekta z Austrii, natomiast na początek kilka informacji organizacyjnych. Po pierwsze, chciałbym podziękować partnerom, dzięki którym jest możliwa organizacja wykładów z cyklu Mistrzowi Architektury. Szczególne podziękowania dla dwóch firm, firma Knauf oraz firma Rampa i Mielin. Mamy dzisiaj przedstawicieli tych firm, pan Paweł Broda z firmy Knauf, pan Adam Rux z Knaufa oraz pani Barbara Huzarewicz z Rampy i Mielin. I pod koniec wykładu będziecie mogli obejrzeć filmiki prezentujące te firmy, natomiast do tego przejdę jeszcze za chwilę. Tradycją cyklu mistrzowej architektury są konkursy. Myślę, że ci, którzy często biorą udział w naszych wykładach o tym wiedzą. Natomiast dla tych, którzy są pierwszy raz, to już przedstawiam. Do wygrania jest książka 2226 autora naszego dzisiejszego mistrza Dietmara Eberle. Jest to książka, która przedstawia budynek o tej samej nazwie, czyli 2226. Budynek wyjątkowy, ponieważ jest to budynek w Austrii, który z pozoru wygląda na zwyczajny budynek, natomiast nie ma w nim wentylacji, nie ma w nim klimatyzacji ani ogrzewania, a mimo to udaje się we wnętrzu utrzymać temperaturę pomiędzy 22 stopnie a 26 stopni. E, więcej dowiedzieć się z tej książki, a żeby ją wygrać należy zrobić dwie rzeczy. Po pierwsze wejść na Instagrama Mistrzów Architektury. Instagram nazywa się Masters of Architecture. Należy polubić, należy zacząć obserwować profil Masters of Architecture i przed chwilą pojawił się tam post konkursowy. I pod tym postem prosimy was o zadawanie pytań. Wszystko co przyjdzie nam do głowy, wszystko co was interesuje. Zapytania do pana Dietmara Eberle, na które później być może odpowie, ponieważ po zakończeniu wykładu Poprosimy naszego mistrza o wybór dwóch najciekawszych pytań i autorzy tych pytań otrzymają książkę, oczywiście z autografem i dedykacją od profesora Eberle. Prosimy zadawać pytania po angielsku, a w przerwie pomiędzy wykładem pana Eberle a odpowiedzią na pytania z sali wyświetlimy filmy dwóch firm, czyli Knaufa i Rampa i Mielin. I jeszcze jedna informacja organizacyjna jest taka, że przez pierwsze 10 minut wykładu pozostawimy na sali włączone światła, tak aby ułatwić pracę naszym dwóm, nawet więcej, naszym fotografom. I po 10 minutach około sala zostanie przyciemniona, tak aby wszyscy czuli się komfortowo, zarówno mistrz architektury, jak i wszyscy tutaj obecni na sali. Mistrzowie Architektury to seria organizowana przez Katowicki Oddział Stowarzyszenia Architektów Polskich, dlatego chciałbym teraz poprosić o zabranie głosu prezesa Katowickiego Oddziału SARP, pana Mikołaja Machulika. Dzień dobry Państwu, witam serdecznie koleżanki i kolegów. Witam naszego gościa Dietmara Eberle. Jest to, tak jak Wojtek powiedział, bardzo nietypowy wykład, bo udało nam się połączyć nasz cykl z imprezą również cykliczną For Design Days, której, którą wspieramy od samego początku jej istnienia jako Stowarzyszenie Architektów Polskich. Stali bywalcy naszego cyklu wiedzą, że mistrzowie architektury wędrują, są w różnych miejscach i też parę lat temu Część wykładów odbywała się tutaj na tej sali w MCK. Wojtek zaprosił na wystawę Mistrzów Architektury 15-lecie podsumowania, które 15-lecie obchodziliśmy w zeszłym roku. Oprócz tego zaraz również zapraszam na dwie pozostałe wystawy, w których jesteśmy organizatorami albo współorganizatorami jako stowarzyszenie. To jest SPAW, który ma dzisiaj premierę 
czyli Śląski Przegląd Architektury i Województwa. To jest wystawa raz na kadencję, czyli raz na 3-4 lata robiona. Można ją również zobaczyć bogatą na antresoli spotka, ponad 80 plansz, ponad 80 realizacji naszych koleżanek, kolegów, architektów z całego Śląska. I wystawa, która podsumowuje w zeszłym roku też rocznicowe najlepszą przestrzeń publiczną i architekturę roku. Dwa konkursy, które organizujemy pod patronatem i wspólnie z marszałkiem województwa. I tu ta wystawa nosi tytuł Dekalog dobrej przestrzeni, zrobiona wspólnie z Marcinem Szczeliną. Dzisiaj miała też wernisaż. Też jest dookólna, taka wędrująca, tak jak ta architektura nasza najlepsza znajduje się w różnych miejscach nawet w jednym mieście, ale w różnych miejscach, więc taki jest koncept tych, tej wystawy. Zapraszam bardzo na wykład. Dziękuję. Dziękujemy bardzo. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here in this special edition of the Masters of Architecture lecture. Today we host an architect from Austria, Mr. Dietmar Eberle, who leads a really big office because uh, he has 14 departments in nine different countries. What's more, he is uh, very well known because of his building 2226, which is located in Lustenau. It's uh, the Baumschlager Eberle Architecten Office. And what's extremely interesting about this building that uh, this is the building with no heating, no air conditioning, no climatization, but uh, nevertheless, there is always still temperature between 22 degrees or and 26 degrees, even in winter. So if you want to know how does it work and uh, how to build uh, some zero energy building like uh, 20 to 26, I invite you to this uh, speech. So please welcome and give him a big amount of applause, Mr. Dietmar Eberle. Okay, good evening and uh, first of all thank you very much for this very kind introduction and uh, I'm very pleased to be in Katowice the first time in my life but uh, I saw a little bit of the city and uh, I decided uh, to come back because when I visit a city first for me there's only one question, do I come back or not? Because that's the only thing normally which I can do in uh, such a short time. Uh, what I want to talk I'm, I'm about, if, if we do a lot of buildings and if I did a lot of buildings in my life, I will not show you a lot of buildings. I will try to explain you a little bit our way of thinking about buildings and uh, what we believe that uh, this uh, is one of the opportunities to manage our future in a more serious uh, way. Because talking about the energy demand, the carbon dioxide footprint, the impact on the environment, which we do by buildings, that's what we do now for a very long time. And on a very personal level, I was <coughs> studying in the 70s. And in the 70s, there was the first oil crisis in Europe. And this was a very nice uh, experience because on certain days there were no cars on the highways. You could travel by bike on the highways. Very nice feeling, you know, very nice. And okay, there were also some other phenomena I don't want to tell you about, but uh, this gave me a very deep uh, impression that there must be a different kind of future, not depending on so many things anymore. Now, dealing with this question for a very long time, uh, I try to tell you very simple, only as a basic information, how we understand the, the, the topic. 
You know that nowadays we speak uh, very much about uh, of carbon dioxide footprint and climate change and things like this. And uh, this is um, something which is very common and I don't know in Polish newspapers, but in a lot of newspapers in every country you can read about this uh, nearly every day. And uh, there are, is a lot of climate change. And when you analyze high developed country, you will discover something very strange. That, for example, in middle, as in, in the middle of Europe, not in the center, but in the middle <laughs> of Europe, uh, normally buildings use about 55% of all energy in a society. And that's a lot. And, uh, for example, all mobility only uses about 18%, or industry and things like this. But this 55% does not mean that the contribution to carbon dioxide footprint is 55%. It's only 35%. But this is mainly because there are other big sources of uh, contributions to greenhouse gases. And maybe you know the biggest one. That's very strange. It's agriculture. So when you want to contribute to reduce the carbon dioxide footprint, please stop to eat meat. It's very simple. This is 32% of greenhouse gas. But nevertheless, the, the contribution of, of houses is still very high. It's 35%. I only want to explain this difference because sometimes uh, we mix up, you know, that uh, when we reduce the energy demand, we immediately re reduce also the carbon dioxide demand. That's not... Uh, very clear and not uh, very true. But, you know, I, I tell you 55% sounds a lot, but I can give you more dramatic examples. In the United States, and this is the official numbers of the United States uh, 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 ministries under Obama, not under Trump, <laughs> But under Obama, they told very clear, 72% of all the energy use in their society is related to housing, to houses. When, but this is not even the highest in the world. You know? When you go to a city like Singapore or Hong Kong, they need set up to 90% of all their energy consumption only for buildings for doing buildings and maintaining buildings. So I don't know the exact numbers in Poland, uh, but uh, that's, it, it will be something similar to what uh, I said, that uh, this is in Central Europe. But then, you know, the carbon dioxide emission nowadays, when we ask ourselves what is the relation to architecture, what are the big things we can do in architecture is mainly three things. The one is we have to talk about urban planning, and this means urban density, because the mobility in the future is a key question to reduce the carbon dioxide footprint. The second level is all the materials, what we use for doing the buildings. It's called the gray energy. And the third level is the maintenance and the running of the buildings. And uh, so all these three levels are really related directly to the question, what kind of ideas do we have in architecture? What kind of technology we use for doing architecture? And uh, what uh, uh, are the opportunities? Today, I will mainly talk about the uh, about the, the, the energy consumption uh, during the lifetime of a building. And I will not talk about urban, urban questions, which would be very important, but, uh, and I will not talk about the grey energy. But the grey energy, which is nowadays when you calculate buildings, I will show you in the end in more detail, this is the biggest impact on the uh, carbon dioxide footprint of a building. And the grey energy 
is very much related to a very simple question. How long will the building survive? How long will the building last? So one of the biggest contributions to what we architects can do is to make buildings which are accepted and loved and uh, by the people for a very long time. And you know, this is not only something good in uh, energy calculation and in, in carbon dioxide footprint. This is also something good for the cultural self-understanding of the society, for the identity of the society. And that's something general, what I can say. When you deal with energy questions, you come down to the basic questions of architecture. What means quality in architecture? You know, at ETH, I did a, a big research about the question, how old become buildings? How? And we, so we, we, we were writing biographies of buildings, not of persons. We were writing and searching what happened to this building in all his lifetime. What made it important? What made it... How was it accepting, accepted during which period? How positive, how negative? How was the, the development of the economic value of a building in all his lifetime and things like this? And in the end, we found out there are only two important questions. Building only become old when they have a high social and cultural acceptance, which means, in a more simple words, when people like these buildings. If people don't like these buildings, they will disappear. But when you tear them down, this is the worst what you can do when you calculate about the carbon dioxide footprint. Because you destroy immediately such a huge amount of resources which are such a bad impact on this uh, uh, balance and, and on this panel. So when you really want to, as an architect, to contribute to the question of how you make buildings and give buildings a long lifetime, and through this long lifetime, their, their carbon dioxide impact will be reduced dramatically, then you have to make good architecture. And that's very funny, you know, that when we really want to do something, we have to be better architects. Very strange, very strange. But until now, we always had the feeling that good architecture is something for architects, but not for developers, not for the people, not for uh, laws, not for public authorities. No, it's the other way around. When we do good architecture, that's the only secret how we can give buildings a long lifetime. And through this long lifetime, we reduce the carbon dioxide footprint every year. So all the people who tell me they want to do buildings for 20 years or just for a short period, etc., they never calculated anything. When they ever would have calculated, they would have known how wrong this, this idea is. It sounds very fashionable, but it's completely wrong. I'm really sorry. That's a really waste of our resources, up to a level you won't believe. But that's OK. So I try to, uh, I, I try to give another basic understanding. When we speak about uh, energy consumption or carbon dioxide footprint, uh, in all our calculations, what we use in the different standards, we have two very big di uh, different phenomena which we integrate into one number. We have the transmission losses and we have the ventilation losses. But nowadays, the transmission losses are even bigger, uh, are, are very small in relation to the, to the to ventilation losses. But the ventilation losses of a building only relate to a question, how many people are using the building at what time? 
But the transmission losses, that's something maybe 20, 25% of all the energy demand. So nowadays we always speak when we talk about if it's warm enough, cold enough and things like this, we talk about the temperature outside. But the temperature outside only has an impact on the temperature inside of about 25%, not more. And that, that's something very complicated to understand. But that's very basic for the understanding of uh, 22, 26. And when you start to optimize the buildings, then you see down here what are the main decisions what you have to do. You have to talk about urban density. You have to talk about the geometry of the building. You have to talk about the quality of material. And something very important, you have to talk about natural light, to, to use, to optimize the use of natural light. So all these things are very architectural questions. So architects can do much more and contribute much more uh, to these questions of reducing uh, the, uh, the energy demand and the carbon dioxide footprint. Why do I speak about reducing? At this moment, we also can have an idea that we say we are replacing the way how we produce energy and things like this. But when you see the real big numbers, then you understand one thing, that only the social, de only the development in civilizations after 1960, this came, brought us up to this tremendous amount of what we uh, use nowadays. I can say this in numbers. In 1960, in Germany or Switzerland, everybody was using 2,000 watt per day. Nowadays, we use 8 to 10,000 watt per day. In Poland, very similar development. Maybe not since 1960, but since 1990. We, we, through our way of living, through our understanding of comfort, through our understanding of quality of life, we, we, the, the price what we pay for is by consumption of energy. And that's the big problem, and that's the big task what we have at this moment. How can we reduce the energy demand on one hand, but keep up the quality of living and the comfort on the other hand? That's a little bit the, the question of the next generation of architects. You know, how can you balance this? Very easy question. You want to keep up the quality, but you are, have to reduce your uh, carbon dioxide footprint and your energy demand by 75%. It's not about 5%, it's not about 10%, it's about 75%. And that's something uh, which is the challenge of our days. Sure, in a global sense, we are still a 2,000 watt society, which means in a global sense, at this moment, uh, we don't use more than about 2,000 watt per person per uh, day. But when you have a close look, who is using this? We, you have to understand, we are using this. And a lot of people in other countries, they have one problem, they want to use the same. But that's not possible in, in, in global terms, you know. A young Pakistani is only allowed to use 10% of your energy, what you compensate, what you use every day. And we can question ourselves how long in the development of human mankind these very big differences have any future. How long will be, they be accepted? And at the moment, you know, that there is a, a lot of discussions that these things are not accepted anymore. If the next, okay, we have different opportunities about this, but that's only... And now, why are we only reacting now? Because maybe, you know, Mr. Keeling, he is the guy who, who found out by measurements 
1958 that there is a direct connection between the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere and uh, the climate. He already found out 58. He did a lot of measurements, and that's very funny. This family, the son now of Mr. Keeling, is doing these measurements even until now. In 1958, we started, at, when they started these measurements, they started on a level of about 320 ppm carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I don't know, but then you, at the moment, we are at about 410. And we, nobody knows at the moment, how do we stop? But what everybody knows, when we come up to 450 ppm, there the <laughs> impact, the first impact will be much more storms, much more rain, much dramatic natural catastrophes. And therefore, insurance companies like the Munich Re, they have a big research uh, pro because they start now to refuse to do any contracts about too high risk. And so a lot of, uh, f of, of issues, what we have now at the moment, buildings, uh, 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 airplanes, there's a problem that they will not get any insurance policies anymore because the risk it becomes much too high. Even if you know this, that the uh, overall uh, uh, part of, of carbon dioxide or the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is only 0.4%. So it's very small. But this big impact until now, we did not believe. And you know, you can imagine that Mr. Keeling became very angry. He could measure this every day, every year. Nobody believed him. We all said, fuck yourself. Go on measurement. But the phenomena is very old. It's not new. And what we see in newspaper nowadays, no, it's known in, in science for a very long time. But you know, when you deal with science, at a certain moment, you start to understand that when you discover something, at least it takes one generation, or sometimes even two and three generations, before this kind of knowledge comes into reality, has some consequences into reality. You can imagine what the family Keeling is feeling. Now they have the feeling, oh, okay, now they understand us a little bit. But we are saying this now for 50 years. It's a long time. And you know, they still measure every day, every year. And you can, they, 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 there's a, a very nice document about the growing of this uh, area and about the relation to uh, the climate. Now, this happened in the 60s. What happened in the 70s? And now, uh, in the 70s, there were first suspicious people who had the feeling there is something wrong. And then they started to deal about alternatives and strategies and things like this. And everybody was a little bit laughing about them, you know, about these strange guys. And they started to speak about South orientation and, and things like this, but it had not really a big impact. But in the 70s, the, the, the experience of the first oil crisis was much more deep than the understanding of the carbon dioxide footprint. What happened in the 80s? And, you know, in the 80s, there, there were now the first strategies, uh, how people try to reduce the, the maintenance energy of a building. The first strategies, which were very popular, uh, were by gaining more energy, which means one was talking about south orientation, about winter garden, about closing the building to the north, and things like this. Then, at the end of the 80s, there were big uh, research programs 
about these strategies. And mainly in this in research, it was clear there were two very different strategies. The one is you focus on, on gaining energy, and the other one is you focus on losing energy to uh, reduce the loss of energy. And in, since the end of the 80s, it is very clear that the reduce the loss of the energy is the only strategy which really works. The gaining of energy you can do in some areas in the world, especially when you have high radiation and very low temperatures, like when you are in the Alps over 1,500 meters, then you can deal with, start to think about with gain, uh, winning energy from nature. But un until there, to reduce the losses is much more efficient. And th the gaining only creates a lot of problems, it, not in winter, but in summer, in, on heat control and things like this. Now, the 90s, now this happened now in Europe, that there were new standards, passive house maybe, or I know that you also know in Poland, or MINA GP, or something like this. And in these standards were the first time that it was very clear that we do not, first of all, we have to reduce the losses, and second, we have to deal with the ventilation problem, the, 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 the ventilation losses. Therefore, all these standards out of the 90s ended up in these technologies, what we are used nowadays, that you have a lot of ventilation machinery with heat recovery all over the world, and uh, especially in, in houses and things like this. And uh, yes, that's the state of the art until now. So what we do at the moment more or less was developed in the 90s. And at this moment, we have a lot of experience with these strategies. But this experience with these strategies, you know better. First of all, 20 to 30% of the investment cost is now relating to this problem. Second, also very simple, they never work. Third, a lot of people never feel well. The controlling of this system is quite complicated. And the maintenance is extremely expensive. I can tell you, for example, uh, Swiss, uh, I'm sorry about Switzerland, but I can tell you Swiss, uh, 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 Swiss districts who say nowadays, the only thing we will never build is a modern building. Because the maintenance cost of these buildings is so high that we have no money left to do new buildings. And uh, you know, I can, uh, this is not only a phenomenon in Switzerland, but this is also a phenomenon in Germany or in Austria. And uh, because the maintenance cost of all keeping up this technology and replacing this technology in very short time frames, you know, is too expensive. We, we afford a lot, but at a certain moment, only to throw money out of the window for to do it every year again, you know, that's not a nice feeling. You can put a lot of money or invest a lot of money once afterwards when you don't have to do it again. But to do this every year is not a nice feeling. But at the moment in, this, in the real estate market, we have a big problem that we have two very different uh, positions. The one is the, the, the developers and afterwards uh, the owners of this. And uh, no, they are different players. And so there is this relation between the investment cost and the maintenance cost is not very uh, important at the moment because these are very, two very different parties. But that's what we did in the 90s. And then in the 20s, in the begin first 10 years of the, this decade, we all started with these new standards, you know? For example, BREAM or DGMB or LEED and things like this. You know, the most successful one is BREAM. You know why? It's more than 100,000 objects certified by BREAM. You know why? Because it's nothing there. 
I'm very sure every building you do, give it to Bream, you will get the stamp. No problem. It's nothing there. It doesn't mean anything. But I, 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 it was very funny for me today that I heard this standard and I said, it's very cheap. You don't have to, you only have to pay a little bit money to the guy who gives you the stamp. That's it. It doesn't mean anything. When you ever study precise, you will find out it's ridiculous. And I'm very sure 90% of the buildings in Poland, it's only a question of small money. But you get your stamp. That's it. No, and but okay. To to make it now more serious, the most uh, serious one is DGNB. But you know, this is also very typical. DGNB only one thousand buildings all over the world got this uh, criteria. But this is more serious. I'm really sorry, you know. But it's okay. But I, I only want to say, even if this is good for developers, that there are stupid people believing other stupid people that one stamp, which is very cheap, becomes more rich. That's fine. But in the end, it doesn't mean it has no impact on the question what we are talking about. It doesn't change too much. Now, that's the. Uh, New, what is our now in the, in the last 10 years, what is, uh, what, has, uh, what is coming up in this discussion? And you know, the first is that the grey energy is coming up as a big issue. And I promise you within the next 10 years, we will have laws and standards all over the world dealing with grey energy question. This is a big task uh, which will come up. The next is the, the everybody is fighting with the more complex technologies uh, what we will have in the building. And the next is, and that's maybe very funny, they're starting at a lot of discussions about the relation between health and architecture, about health and uh, the built environment. And at the moment, there is one big uh, research project, uh, which I know, which is uh, the research project is more than 10 million euros. And they have this idea that by reducing the humidity of the air from 40% to 30%, which is a benefit in energy value from about 15%, increases the infection rate by 100%. So what they believe at the moment is we reduce a little bit the energy demand by drying the air down to 30%. And at the same time, we increase the cost in the health uh, sector, in medicine, by, because by doing this, we double the infection rate determined by houses. So in the overall, as a society, it's a stupid investment. It, it, we, we, but we have a lot of money, so we waste a lot of money at the moment. But uh, I think the study will be finished in about four years, and this is the first one who really focus on this, but that's not so important, because we were all you know, all our government were very proud to reduce the percentage, the humidity percentage from four in, in the standards, in the laws, from 40 to 30 percent, which has a certain impact on the energy use. So they can do fine numbers, but <laughs> it doesn't make too much sense. The, the number of people who become ill through this is increasing. Uh, and things like this. But okay, I only want to say that there are a lot of open questions, you know? Uh, and you see, that's uh, now what are the goals when, when, we speak, when I speak about 22, 26? First, we, we want to have a better quality of health and comfort in the building. 
So I'm not interested in making the building quality worse, but there are a lot of phenomena in modern buildings which are not that nice, you know. You have uh, air flows, you have a lot of dust, you have a, low, a very dry air level and things like this. And I be don't believe that, in a long-term view, I never believe in bad things. I always believe in good things, you know. Good for the feeling of the people. And second is, sure, we have to reduce the energy and uh, reduce the carbon dioxide footprint. But then there is another big issue all over the world, what I recognize at the moment, that the construction cost in relation to the income of people were growing much too fast during the last 20 years. So there's not a very nice relation at the moment anymore between the construction cost and the income of people. This relation is so important. Look, once uh, one of my students did a very nice research. He asked himself how many square meters of built area on the market I can buy by the average income of one year. And you know, he found out in a, in a city like Zurich, you can buy 10 square meters. In a city like Chengdu or Guangzhou, you can buy 1.2 square meters. So in a, it, I, I could give you now numbers from all a lot of cities, not from Polish cities, I don't know. But that's a very simple and interesting question. How is the relation of income in relation to what you can afford? You know, uh, what you can afford. Okay, there are, and then I think everybody knows we have the same phenomena in food industry, in, 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 in uh, that to use the local possibilities, to look the local backgrounds uh, uh, according to a lot of arguments, uh, uh, much more important because until now we. That's what I also, we, we have the feeling that uh, we are very modern when we use a lot of technology which you cannot get at the place where you build, you know. Therefore, the buildings start to look the same and things like this. Okay, that's uh, the thing. And now, how do we understand 22, 26? It's, first of all, we, we, in our understanding, we focus on the transmission, that the transmission should be as low as possible. The second is that we say, what is the nice thing what we have in Europe? We have very good air qualities. We have one of the best air qualities all over the planet. In, in numbers, this is about 400 ppm uh, per uh, uh, carbon dioxide per cubic meter. So let us use fresh air as much as possible. You know? And I, I also like to do this because I recognize everybody likes. What do people like to do? They like to open the window. When do they walk? It's very easy. So why don't we do? You know? Then the next one is, and especially uh, when we deal with hot water, this is the biggest energy demand what we have when we do housing. It's not any more heating or something else. It's hot water, the production of hot water. And there are some technologies involved which you can, we can increase this, uh, the performance there uh, very much. And you know what we don't need anymore in a building is the, all the operation and uh, of all the operating energy for the building technology. We always think when we put uh, a heat pump or when we put uh, uh, heating, or it doesn't matter. That, but there is a lot of an, an additional energy necessary to make these things work. When you do a passive house, you have a ventilator working 8,000 hours all the year, because otherwise the building will collapse. When you do a heating, you need a lot of pumps only to transport the water in the building. So there's a lot of operating in energy only uh, determined by the technology. And I don't know, I hope there are no engineers in here, because they always will tell you this is nearly nothing. 
I only say, nowadays, when we speak about energy demand of building, this is a high percentage. But nevertheless, that's what we do. Then the next thing is that we try to use natural daylight as much as possible. Because when we, first of all, it's cheap, it doesn't cost anything. But second, which is more important, is that the artificial lightning is a heating. It's a heating, I'm sorry. But, uh, uh, the, the, and nowadays we speak about dimensions that, to, uh, that you heat the building uh, with the light or something like this. And then the next one is the electrical equipment. But I think what you have in every building anywhere, and also this is all electrical equipment is always heating, you know, it's always uh, raising the temperature by, by nature, I cannot change. But what is very important is this. The, oh, sorry, wrong direction. What is very important is this, that we understood that the need of energy in a building is mainly related to the use of the building. But the use of the building is the only thing we cannot calculate. Because nobody knows how many people are there, what time, or when, or when do they change, or does is it used for housing, for a director, for... Nobody knows. But at this moment, in all the calculations, we always say we know. Therefore, we make all equipment big enough, which only means we waste a lot of energy. So then afterwards, we have the feeling everything is possible. We know it's not, but nevertheless, that's what we do a little bit in every building. And so for me, the most important part of a building is a person. And what, is a, what does a person do in a building? First of all, a person has in physical terms, three very important impacts. The first one is, the person is a heater. You bring 80 watts to 100 watts with you, and if you want to not to do this anymore, you have to kill yourself. Until then, you are a heater. I'm sorry, this is energy I cannot change, you know. Second, you take a lot of oxy oxygen from the air and you do you produce carbon dioxide so you make the air quite bad and the third one is you lose about every day about one and a half liters of humidity and uh, which also evaporates to the air so the question so what we are interested in 22, 26 is the impact of people onto the building. And then we try to make the building intelligent to react on the impact which is done by people. And that's what we try to, tried to develop. That this is, okay, well, that, I, I don't know. So that this is uh, possible is something very simple. I knew this since the 90s, but I never had time to do it. But I knew that we don't need all this anymore since the 90s. But you know, as architects, you always have a lot of things to do. But the second issue, what is for me very important, I will make this very short. We understand a building nowadays as an overlapping of five very different time frames, which gives an impact on how you focus your design onto. So for me, the most important decision is what you do, is the, the, your urban decision. How do you position a building? And this decision normally will not be replaced and stays there even if the building is torn down for more than 200 years. So, so to think about the urban question, what does your building contribute to the site? What does your building contribute to the public? That's the architectural decision which is the longest impact in time. 
The next one is to do the structure of the building. The structure of the building is completely independent from the use of the building. Because if you don't separate these two things, the building is lost anyway. You tear down as soon as the program is changed. The next one is the building envelope normally reaches a lifetime of about 50 years. And then the function or the program is normally a phenomena of one generation, not more. Normally, I ask people, do you want to live like your parents? Do you want to work like 20 years ago? Do you want to teach like 20 years ago? The answers are always very clear. So why do we believe when we design it now that this will not be the answer in 20 years? So we have to make buildings that different functions, programs can be integrated into the buildings. I don't want to talk in detail about what, is has, what kind of impact this has onto your design. But I believe this uh, is a very important thing that we say that we try to do design with this con oh, sorry, we try to do design with these consequences. So we focus very much on the public issue, on, on the contribution to the site on the structure of the building, on the building envelope. And that's always very funny, you know, because all we architects are trained to start with the program. So always when I ask, what do you design when you have no program? That's an intellectual problem. Huh? But that's exactly what we have to do. And then the function and then the, the surfaces, you know, the, all these interiors. And the surfaces is not only the visible surfaces like floor, ceiling, wall, and things like this, but it's also all the technology. The average lifetime of a heating system in a building is 10 to 15 years. Okay, we can try to save the world every 15 years, but it's only a lot big waste of money, it's all. That's all. So, okay, that's what we try to. So, I show you only examples of uh, how we think this, this urban issue. This is a decision of one. All these projects I've done myself. So, I only. The next one is a structure that's a hospital, 180,000 square meter big. And the only question I had to the doctors was very simple What happens to this building? when your hospital doesn't exist anymore. Because hospitals will disappear. But the buildings, these dramatic big buildings, they will be there. So, the, so we did a lot of designs only thinking about no hospital anymore. What do we do with this big building? How can we use this big building? But the structure is always there, you know, when you start, start to tear down the structure, you ruin your building. Then that's the envelope of the building. Uh, and, you know, normally it's much too expensive to change the envelope, so you keep it as long as possible. And uh, then this is the function. This is an entrance room for a hospital, that's also. But I know 10 years, it will be gone. I hope there will be even something more nice, you know. But the, or the, at this place there will be something different. That's part of the game. And that's the services, you know, that's the services, the, uh, what we have to do. Now, uh, this is only very, this is the world climate, uh, uh, the world climate summary for policymakers, direct and indirect. And there you see 18% of the buildings and the gray energy for building 13%. That's global. That's not local anymore. That's a global. And then you see up there, you see the agriculture. Down there, you see transportation. Transportation is a small phenomenon. But, uh, but nowadays we all speak about electrical cars to save the world again, you know, but that's uh, not, uh, doesn't mean, and, but this is officially numbers, you know, so I don't, uh, and then this is what changed in the buildings during the last uh, 20 years. Uh, I did two buildings, both of them were with very ambitious clients. The one is with the Munich Re, that's the biggest reassurance company uh, in the world, doing all the ins insurances for all the, when you, you know, when you, do a, when you shoot a rocket to the, 
uh, uh, to, to, to the universe, you know what is the most expensive one? It's the insurance policy. It's not any material, not any techniques. No. It's only the insurance policy. That's the most expensive one because the risk is very high. And uh, okay, but this, so these companies, and then you see during these 10 years, there's a big progress in understanding the uh, optimization, the different figures and the different phenomena, what you have in a building. I don't want to, but you should always understand that you have a lot of different energy phenomena, phenomena in the building. And the question is, how do you bring them together? How do you connect them? Okay, and you know, this is my, Simple understanding, everybody knows a diagram like this, and this always goes from, you see here, oh, sorry, 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 I have to go back. Okay, you see, it goes, oh yeah, it goes from, from winter to summer, here, and then winter again, and the blue line is the outside temperature, the green line is the inside temperature determined by the use of the building, the red and the blue is the heating and the cooling, and that's the overall capacity. When you are an engineer, very easy. You look, oh sorry, you look here, and you look here. When you are an architect, I tell you, you look here. Why do you look here? There you have to do nothing, everything is fine. And that's a little bit how we understand <laughs> 22. Well, look, I've been working on these questions for 30 years, and so we developed a, a, a kind of optimization of a building. And then when you optimize the building, you can reach a result, a result like this, oh sorry, Okay, uh, that the period where you don't have to do anything becomes much longer. This is only a question of how do you do your design. And it's nothing else. It's only a question of how to, and then the impact is very simple. The heating and the cooling reduces dramatically. But now that's what we do in 22, 26. Maybe you see it's the same diagram, but there is one big difference. It's no red and no blue anymore, which only means no heating and no cooling necessary anymore. And there, we, you see, this is the 22, 26 area. This is, again, the outside temperature of the year 2018. And then you see there was minus 10 degrees in a certain period. And then you see there was uh, 38 degrees in summer in a certain period. And then you see there is a boring line. That's the green line. And then in all this year, we had two days where we had more than 26 degrees in one room. We had 27 degrees. But outside, it was 38. And you understand, so our progress is something very simple. That's the starting point. That's an average chart of a normal building. Next time, we developed a, st a strategy by optimizing our buildings that the periods where you don't have to do anything, it becomes much longer. And third step, how did we reach this goal? We reached this goal by using software to manage the relation of the building inside and outside. That's all. So we have three steps. Make a serious building. Let everybody do what he wants to do at every place in the building where he wants. And third one is use a software to balance the relation between the inside and the outside. Now, I think it's, it's, it's very simple, but you can imagine that there's quite a, a little bit of knowledge how you should do this, but that's fine. Uh, and uh, yes, but we, I, I don't want to talk about, I, I show you now the building very simple. It's a three, you see, that's the structure of the building. It's, a 3, 000, it's six floors, 3,000 square meters. And uh, you can see in this building, you can do what you like, you know. And I'm very proud that in the building we have a yoga studio. 
We have a, a, a guy who is doing fitness training as an individual trainer. We have a marketing uh, company. We have an art gallery. We have a small rest cafeteria restaurant. We have one apartment. And uh, well, one moment. And we have our own offices. Yes, that's it. Uh, so when I would think about this before, would not be possible, you know. I, I, I never would think that you do a yoga studio next to your office, but that's nice, you know. But they like it. I don't know. Every mor Monday morning, there are a lot of women there doing yoga. I don't know why, but that's okay. Uh, and so, so, but this is very important, you know. So this is the very simple section. This is now uh, the temperature. Uh, and, and I only want to explain to you once more. The first thing when we design, we try to calculate the building that nobody ever enters the building. I'm interested in a very simple question. What happens to the building, to the temperature inside of the building in relation to the weather? And we don't, in this calculation, nobody ever was there. And, but this is the, 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 the quality of your design, you know, to balance the building much better to your very local backgrounds, understandings, uh, technologies, and things like this. And then the next one is that's maybe the use of the building, but this curve, the green line, this can be very different because you have a lot of different opportunities how you will organize. And then this one is then the, the use of the software to manage the relation from inside and the outside. So you will ask me, what is the software? So this is how the building looks like. It, it's, uh, done in, it, it's done in the most traditional materials which we can find in this uh, area. It's a plaster, brick, concrete, Local wood, local plaster, everything local. So it's very, very traditional done. And you know and I know when you always use the traditional materials, the building is always the most cheap one. The, the, these technologies are always the most cheap one. So what can the building do? The building only can do two things. That's very funny. It can open and close the window. And it can switch on and switch off the light. Things what people normally do anyway. But we try to help the building to make it a little bit more intelligent. So we need sensors in every room for carbon dioxide, humidity, inside temperature, and outside temperature. And based on this information, the, and based on, on the conditions what you have in the room, the software is calculating how the building should behave. We are not interested in how the temperature goes outside. We are only interested of the impact of the temperature outside to the temperature inside. OK, now I show you once more. OK. Yeah. I think it's nice, but at least for me, you know, at, at least for me. It's a very simple building. And you know, this is local plaster done in a very old technique with chalk. Then this is one stair, there's another stair. This is the surfaces. This is, uh, you see, LED light. That's the cafeteria. That's uh, the office, our own office. That's a meeting room. Okay, and you know that's the oh, that's some details. So, what did we reach? We built this building in 2013. So the building is in use for six years, and this is the best measured building in the world because we measured the building in a time frame of 30 seconds every room. Humidity, carbon dioxide, inside temperature, things like this. So I can tell you all the biography of the building, of the biography of every room, you know? So this gives us the security to say that we really know very well. 
This one is the uh, electricity consumption of the building. When we speak about electricity consumption, that's the elevator, that's the outside lightning, that's the inside light, that's all the computers, all the coffee machine, all the refrigerators, it's everything. Well, and you know, we, we found out that about 20% of all the energy in the building is only used in the kitchen of the cafeteria. 20% is only used there. You know? So that, that's the results uh, what we have. And I'm very proud. And you, you see, in winter, it is by nature that you need more energy because in winter you have much less sunlight. The sunlight difference from winter to summer, at least in our area, but here it's not very different, it's more than six hours. You know? So you need much more artificial light in winter anyway. But when you do your building correct, the artificial light is the heating of your building. You, you need this artificial light anyway. I cannot, uh, you cannot work in the dark. So the artificial light is the heating of uh, your building. Now I could give you diagrams like this and you always have to look uh, sorry, up here you see that's the inside temperature. You know, this uh, is a, a one-person room. That's my personal office. And it only says I don't have a big impact on the office. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, and you see, and when you see that the carbon dioxide level is down here, it only means you are never there. Because it's the same, it's, it has the same level of air quality like the outside air, you know, carbon dioxide. But then you can also see here, this is, for example, the same room with about six people, same dimension of room with about six people. And then you see the green is also very boring. It's always there. But what is different is the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide goes much higher, and then the, the, the ventilation, uh, you know, that the windows open, goes much faster. But that's what the building do themselves. There is, uh, okay, I, I don't want to explain you this graph, but the, I, I, can, I measured everything, you know, so for many, many years. So, you know, this is the result now for this room of uh, 2018. And then you see once more this phenomena I told you here about the 27 degrees. At, at the, there was a heat period with tropical nights uh, uh, over here. But you see, it, you see here it was 26, and you see it never went over 27 degrees without anything. Even if it was very hot, you know, during, and you see the outside was 38 and things like this. And, you know, what, how is the building built? You see a very shortly bricks, concrete, prefabricated concrete. Then that's the layout of the, you see all the different uses and how it is separated into different uh, parts, into different. And then what, what did we, re so first, the building was about 25% cheaper than an average building at the same time. I think it's very reasonable because when you take away all the technology, you, you read free. I'm sorry, this is not 10%, it's much more normally. Second, and that's very funny, I didn't do these calculations, the life cycle cost of the building is, you know, there's first a new standard in Germany about life cycle cost, who gives a very simple question, how high are the costs of the building in 50 years? You know, and they, they had very specific, and they always, I'm very proud, because they always use this building as their big goal. They did not find a better one until now. And so you see, in 50 years, it's half the price of an of a even ambitious good building. It's half the price. So to make it other way around, it makes you rich. <laughs> so the value of the building is increasing according to market, but your investment is not go going up. The next one is something very simple. The energy consumption of the building is about 70% less than the average uh, energy building. 
Then the next one is also, okay. Okay, now to make it now very simple, we are very happy with this building. It works perfect. And at the moment, I will show you afterwards, we are developing a lot of other projects with this technology. I want to show you two small projects. The one is, uh, 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 oh, sorry. The one is this project. It's a university in Luxembourg, Le Maison de Savoie. So all the teaching of this university is done in this building. And this building is 180 meters long and 100 meters high. And in this building, we have no mechanical ventilation, even if it's really big. We have no cooling, even if it's really high, it's 100 meters high. And we only have um, mechanical ventilation in the lecture halls, which are bigger than 200 people. So that's all. And it's in use, and they tell me it works very well. So, yes, and it was quite cheap again, I'm sorry, because when you don't invest all these things. So it's not, a, that, but then I show you, that's the entrance of one part of the building. You see, it, it's situated in an old uh, uh, steel mill, pro, steel production area. And uh, therefore, in, in, the, in the building, we used only very simple materials, concrete and steel, that's all, for the surfaces. You know, it's a little bit tough, the, the, it's a real, but that's okay. And you know, this is the, okay, the, you know, that's only for architects, or that's for developers, oh, sorry, no, I'm sorry, I'm doing the wrong direction. I'm sorry, I'm doing the wrong direction, you know. The cantilever here, over here, that's only for engineers the, or, or for developers. The, the cantilever here is 28 meters. The building is 40 meters. Uh, and the, the bridge over here, the free span over here is 55 meters. So everything, I, I like this industrial area and in industry, everything is very, tough and uh, big and brutal, and I like this attitude, you know. So, but I know when you t tell an engineer, we do now a cantilevered area of 28 meters, which is 40 meters wide and uh, 18 meters high, normally they will tell you this is much too expensive. You know? But I like this attitude of the building, you know. That's the reason why I did it. And uh, I'm very proud on this building because whenever you go to Luxembourg and you don't, you want to see the building, you don't have to go to the site. You can buy a stamp in the post office, and there only this building is on the stamp. They, they because they somehow seem to like the building, you know. So they did a stamp for the building. It's okay, that's okay. And now I show you another building. That's very. That's a very small building, very simple. And uh, that's, um, look, the, the, the client of this building is a woman. And she comes to me every two or year, three years in autumn, and she tells me, I earn some money. What shall we do? So I built with her more than seven small projects. Every year I built a small, not every year, but every two or three years, I built a small project for her. And you know, this, and this, so having this very good relation to this uh, client, I dared to do a building without any technology. And so this was the first building I dared to do, not because, uh, without any heating, cooling, and ventilation. And I, I knew the building will not be able to be used all the year. But we were very much interested how much time in the year you can use the building. You know? And the structure is, is a concrete structure, and, and the surface of the building is a glass uh, outside. And you can use these buildings about 320 days in the year, but not through to, uh, to uh, Then you still have temperatures about 19 to 20 degrees, uh, up to 25, 26 degrees, uh, you can use. But I only did dare to do this because we have such a trustful relationship for so many years. And so we both said, now we, tr we dare to do this, you know. And so we did the building. 
Yes. And it's, it's mainly, the building is for meetings and events, and it's situated in the harbor, and the harbor is the place where he, she's running, and she's earning uh, the money. Now, I, I want to give you uh, some numbers, how we calculate these things in future. You see, this number is mainly focusing on the greenhouse gas emission. This number is focusing on the primary energy, uh, non-renewable uh, non -re kilowatt hours per square meter and year. And then you see something very strange. In total, that's the number of uh, total. But these are two parts. This is the operating cost, and this is the gray energy, the manufacturing. What is necessary to produce the building? And you see, the blue line is a very good uh, building on a passive house level. In Switzerland, this is called Minagi, Mina GP. The, the red one is the goal which they have in Switzerland for the 2040. In 2040, they don't want to allow any buildings anymore who are worse than these red lines. And the yellow one is 2226. So we can say at this moment, we re we so there are two phen phenomena interesting. First is that uh, the operating uh, energy, uh, the carbon dioxide footprint for the greenhouse gases is already lower than the free energy what is in the building. And th so the question of the materials will become more and more important for how to do the buildings. The second one, which is, and that's the energy all over, you see, uh, so we could also say, okay, we are even low, much low of all the goals what very ambitious societies have for 2040. You know, and but these kind of calculations, what we show you here, this will become very standardized in Europe in future. It's about manufacturing energy, it's about operating energy, it's a total, it's divided into impact on carbon dioxide and it's uh, separated uh, energy demand uh, in, in kilowatt hours per square meter. You know? That's what we can reach at the moment. Now, what kind of follow-up projects did we do or how do? This is a, a laboratory research building in Liechtenstein, which is already in use. It's not that radical, but it's the same one. That's in, in Switzerland, in Emmen, in, um, uh, in Lucerne. That's al already in use, uh, and it's used for teaching, for office, uh, and things like this. That's a, a very traditional building in a traditional village up in the mountains. And uh, yeah, it's already in use. And this is housing mixed with offices and medical treatment. So two floors for, me for doctors and for this is a social organization, one floor down there for office and the upper floor for housing. This is a small building, and this is a project in Hamburg, which is uh, not under, well, but it will be under construction quite soon. This is a big building in uh, Schlieren in uh, Zurich, with about 20,000 square meters of office space. And uh, this is for the biggest and most famous Swiss uh, fund. It's for SPS, it means Swiss prime site. You know, they, they are the most valuable, uh, 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 the most valuable uh, real estate fund in Switzerland. This is in Berlin. This is an overall development of an all district of about 200,000 square meters. This is in Vienna. Uh, that's about uh, altogether about 24,000 square meters. This is housing. What we do now at the moment, uh, we will start building in about July. It's about 100 apartments of housing. And this is in Geneva. It's about uh, 40,000 40, square meters of buildings and things like this. So. What I want to say you at the end, first, 
we believe very much in this idea because this idea has some, at least in our understanding, uh, advantages. But the most important advantage is uh, very clear. The comfort in these buildings are much higher. That's what all people say when they use these buildings. The air is better, the humidity is better, and they feel much more natural. There is no dust in the building, there is no turbulence in the building, nothing. It, it, it feels more relaxed. That's what people always say. So whenever you like to go there and to test it, come there every two months for at least two days, and then after one year you have experienced the building in all different uh, seasons, and then you will find out it, it feels very different. That's what they say. Sorry. Then, no, oh, sorry. Okay. 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 Okay, I'm, it's okay. Can you give me? <laughs> okay, the next is that uh, the carbon dioxide footprint is dramatically less than a normal building. One could reduce the carbon dioxide footprint once more by dealing much more, it's okay, thank you, by dealing much more with, uh, with the, the material question. Uh, the, all the, about the gray energy, this will be the big task for the next 10 years, you know, how to deal with the gray energy. And the third one, I want to say that uh, we are very glad and very proud that we have a cooperation in Krakow with DDGM, and Pavel and Magda are sitting here, and uh, we hope uh, that we together will be able to do also some 22, 26 buildings in Poland. Very simple. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Eberle. What was amazing is uh, that in the first part of your lecture, there was no images on your slides, but I saw that all the audience was fully concentrated. So thank you very much. Now we have three more minutes to ask questions on Instagram. And now, Mr. Eberle, we ask you to sit here to start choosing uh, the most interesting questions. Macie jeszcze trzy minuty na zadawanie pytań na Instagramie. Konkurs nadal trwa. Przypominam, że profil nazywa się Masters of Architecture i przypominam, że aby móc wygrać nagrodę, konieczne jest obserwowanie tego profilu. Także zachęcam jeszcze przez trzy minuty do zadawania pytań pod postem konkursowym. Ok, so uh, once again, thank you for being here and uh, thank you for asking your questions. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. Mamy zwycięzców. Pierwszym pytaniem jest, do you think that it's possible to build a small house like 2226? Pytanie należy do Adam, że 91. Zapraszamy na scenę. Serdecznie gratulujemy i zapraszamy autora pytania na scenę po odbiór nagrody. Czy jest autor pytania na sali? Jak się nazywa? Użytkowni Adam, Adam, że 91. Jeśli nie ma, to po prostu wybierzemy inne pytanie, ponieważ mamy czterech faworytów. Także przepadła okazja do wygrania książki, więc jakie jest kolejne pytanie? Which city is the most inspiring or challenging for sensibility for you and why? Jalowiecka. Również nie ma autorki pytania na sali? W takim razie prosimy o jeszcze jedno pytanie. How does your ideal architecture future will look like? And who is the author? Sebe Brandt. <laughs> Jest. Mamy zwycięzcę, serdecznie gratulujemy. Okay. We repeat a question. How does your ideal architectural future will look like? I, I think it is, again, uh, important that uh, 
architects become more and well respected and better paid people because they need much less support by other disciplines. They are more, they, they have, a, in future they have once more again a more deep understanding of what they do. And I think uh, what they do is mainly about cultural identity is one question. And second is they don't need engineers for houses anymore. Not in the love field. Okay, so congratulations. So, thank you very much. So that's for Could you. you give your signature uh, on the okay. on the book? Sebastian. Sebastian, okay, that's fine. Is this okay? Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> okay. What's the date of today? Six. Thank you. Gratulujemy serdecznie i została do wygrania jeszcze jedna nagroda. Pytanie brzmi: What is the most important advice about creating projects in the future? And uh, would you like to give to young architects, students a good way? Hmm. Vicky Kraf. Okay, I, I, th I think the answer is uh, for Zapraszamy. me for me very clear, you know. First, and I think that's the most important, trust yourself. Don't believe anything. But on the other hand, know everything. You have to judge yourself. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> and gratulations. Thank you. What's your name? Victoria. English. Or the same in, in Polish. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dziękujemy za wzięcie udziału w konkursie. Jeśli są jeszcze pytania z sali, to zapraszamy. Okay, Mr. Eberle, uh, we thank you for participating in the event as a gift for you. Uh, of course, if there is no questions, uh, we invite you to ask Mr. Eberle um, privately after the lecture. He is going to stand here uh, until the evening. I zapraszamy też na wieczorną galę, która zaczyna się o 19 tutaj e, w Międzynarodowym Centrum Kongresowym. Zapraszamy też na kolejne wykłady z cyklu Mistrzowie Architektury już niekoniecznie w ramach For Design Days. Ale w kwietniu odbędzie się wykład Juliana Wejera, który reprezentuje biuro z Kopenhagi CF Meller Architects. Także serdecznie zapraszamy nie tylko podczas For Design Days, ale też na wszystkie pozostałe wykłady z cyklu Masters of Architecture. So once again, thank you very much for making time for coming to Katowice to share your knowledge with us, with our architects, with our students, young people. And uh, once again, give a big applause to our guest lecturer, Dietmar Eberle. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much.